Let the church say amen again. Amen. God is good how often? All the time. And all the time. God is good. Find somebody nearby and say, neighbor. Neighbor. God loves you. God loves you. And I do too. And I do too. And if you love me. And if you love me. As much as I love you. As much as I love you. Then nothing can break. And nothing can break. I love him too. too. Look at the other one. You didn't want to look at the first time. Say, good to see you too. Good to see you. Amen. 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 God is good yet once more and again that he has blessed us with this opportunity that we as people are to come into his house, gather together and worship and praise in his holy and his divine name. That is why the Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes, sir. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about y'all, but I recognize that it could have been another way, but I'm sure no glad that it's this way. It, things in your life, even though things in your life aren't the way you want them to be, I want you to know things could be worse than they are right now. I know you may not have the things that you would like to have, but let me tell you, somebody somewhere will be glad to get the things that you take for granted. This is the day that the Lord has made. You ought to rejoice and be glad. He didn't have to let you live, but he woke you up this morning. Didn't have to start you on your way, but he let you put one foot in front of the other. That's why you ought to come into the house of God, and into his gates with thanksgiving and come into his courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name for the Lord is good. And it's not good some of the time, but he's good all the time. Guess what? When you ain't no good, he's still good. When you are in opposition of God, he's still looking out for you. My God causes rain to come down on the just as well as the unjust. You ain't worthy, but he let the rain fall anyhow. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? He's a wonderful savior. He's a wonderful saint. And that's why we ought to be glad to have this opportunity to be here on this morning. Just one more. You don't know. This may be the last opportunity that you have. Oh, what you want. And I dare not let anything that I got going on in my life stop me from pressing my way to the house of God. Man, the devil been beating up on me on Monday, tripped me up on Tuesday, bought me down on Wednesday, had me wrecking my brain on Thursday, had me walking the floor on Friday. I didn't know if I was going to make it through Saturday, but I woke up on Sunday morning and I purpose in my mind, if don't nobody else want to praise him, I praise him all by myself. Hope you can't have chest this morning. I, you can't see him, but the Lord is here this morning. He is here. He said, well, two or three are gathered together in my name, touching and agreeing on anything. He said, there am I in the midst of them. And I would have you to know that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty to set you free. Where the spirit of the Lord is. You ain't going to get it nowhere else. Where the spirit of the Lord is. And I want to be where his presence is on this morning. I don't just want to go to church. I want to go where Jesus is. I don't, I don't just want to go where a bunch of folk are gathered. I want to go where I can hear a word from the Lord that's going to give me what I need to do. Come back with my adversary. Amen. God is good. We want to thank all of you that have tuned in with us um, this morning. So good to see all of you that are here on this morning. So good to look out and see you all. And I pray that you have come um, with your mind on Jesus on this morning. And in spite of what's going on in your personal life, in spite of what's going on around us, God is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. Amen. I want to um, just say I'm so thankful for all of the, the parents, I would say, um, that encouraged and you sent um, your, your kids out this morning to, uh, we had our, our Bible study. Man, I, 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 and we, I looked up, here come another, look up, here come another, look up, here come another. We had a, we had a class full this morning, and, and as, we, as we carefully but surely try to get back to some kind of sense of normalcy. I, I encourage you all to not just be partially in, but let's get all in. And, and let's support the work of God because the work of God still got to go on. Amen, somebody? So let, let, let us encourage and, and be there and do um, what we can. Now, if you can't hear a word from the Lord this morning, be going to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yes, sir. 
First Timothy chapter six, and we're going to read verses six through 11. One thing, and I would ask you all to pray for me on Thursday night. Um, I took my oath and I swore in. I am officially um, a committee person, chairperson for the Duval Democratic Party here in Duval County. Amen. Um, amen. So, so, so pray for me. Um, it, it's not only a good opportunity for me, it's a good opportunity for us. Yes, amen. And, and I'm going to need y'all support in a few years. Amen. So, 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 so pray for me. Pray for me. God be with me. Amen. Well, and yield not to temptation for yielding is sin well and these victory will help you and some others to win and fight manfully on word of passion some do oh and the ever to Jesus and Jesus will carry you all you gotta do is just ask the Savior to help you oh to comfort strength and keep I know Jesus is willing to help and my Jesus will carry you through well and shun evil companions bad language this day oh and God's name hold in reverence and no take it in vain Thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Oh, and look ever to Jesus, and my Jesus will carry you. All you gotta do is just ask the Savior to help. Lord, to comfort, strength, and keep. I know Jesus is willing to aid. And my Jesus will carry you through. Well, and to him that overcome if God give it the crown and through faith we shall conquer and though often cast down and he who is our savior our strength will renew oh just look And Jesus will carry you. All you gotta do is just ask the Savior to help, Lord, to comfort, strength, and keep. I know Jesus is willing to aid, and my Jesus will. First Timothy chapter six, verses six through 11, the Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we shall take nothing out. Tell somebody I ain't never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. If we have food and clothing, we shall be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, O oh man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse number 11 for our consideration. But you, O oh man of God, flee from these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I want to give for, for our subject on this morning simply, flee these things. Flee these things. Tell somebody some stuff that you got to flee. Flee from these things. Now, now the Apostle Paul, we know, he had a special bond with his spiritual son by the name of Timothy. And he considered him, if you would say, to be his very own son. We see where he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 18, he said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you might wage the good warfare. Now, Paul and Timothy had spent a great deal of quality time with one another. And Paul did what he could to urge Timothy to go out and to preach the word and to flee from those sinful things that abound around him. And Paul had a great confidence in Timothy and he sent him several times to new congregations to remind them and encourage them to worship God according to the word of God. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 17 he says for this reason I sent Timothy to you who is my beloved son and faithful son in the Lord who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach you everywhere in the church and perhaps the greatest example that we have which shows how much Paul loved and respected Timothy is in Philippians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 where he says but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I may also be encouraged when I know your state for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state for all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ but you know his proving character that a son with his father he served with me in the gospel of Jesus Christ now as you can see Paul really thought a lot about Timothy, but at the same time, he realized that Timothy was a young man, and he was also concerned that Timothy might at some point stray away from the faith. And that is why you find Paul writing to Timothy and encouraging his son Timothy to keep the faith. And not only to keep the faith, but to stay away from those things that are evil. And so we are going to examine this morning the things that Paul tells Timothy to flee from. And in, verse, in the scriptures that we read beginning at verse number 9, he says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snap, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pieced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. All these things that Timothy is to flee from have to do with the greediness for the love of money. Now, the number one thing is you got to remember you got to flee temptation. The word temptation means a trial or it can mean a test. And this trial or this test can be either good or it can be evil. Now, temptations can lead you to sin while some temptation can be used to test you and to cause you to grow as a child of God. Now, James gives us an example of both. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Tell somebody, if you want patience... You're going to have to be tried. He says that the trying of your faith work is patient. You cannot brag about it. And I say it often. You cannot brag about the faith that you have until your faith has been put to the test. You cannot brag about the patience that you have until your patience has been put to the test. Whatever it is that you claim, it cannot be proven unless it is tested. This is where temptation is used 
Um, it is used in a good sense because it produces patience. James says to us in verse number 13 and 14 of chapter 1, he said, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But here it is. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his what? Own desire. So stop saying the devil made you do it. Because you are lured away by your own desires and by your own enticements. In other words, you went over there because you wanted to go over there. You, you did it because that's what you wanted to do. You got caught up in it because that's what you wanted to get caught up in. You did it because that's what you was big and bad enough to do. This is the kind of temptation that produces evil. And this is the kind of temptation that Paul is instructing young Timothy against. And every Christian that you ought to run, you ought to flee from these things. Now the only way to beat temptation is to run away from it. Tell somebody you got to run away from it. Some people seem to think that they can be around a temptation every day, day after day, day after day without ever being tempted to indulge in it. Man, I don't care how white your dress is, you walk around that mud pen long enough, it's gonna get some mud on it after a while. You know what they are playing, a very dangerous game. Paul said it right in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good morals. We can learn a great lesson from Joseph in the Old Testament because he knew when to run. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said we can learn yes, a great lesson from Brother Joseph in the Old Testament because Joseph knew when he needed to stay and he knew when he needed to get on the run. Genesis chapter 39 verses 11 and 12, it said, but it happened about this time. When Joseph went into the house to do work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his gun. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. The Bible says that she left his garment in her hand, and he fled and he ran outside. How many of us would have been on the run? Potiphar's wife had set things up so she could get Joseph alone so that she might fulfill her desires. But as soon as Joseph knew her intention, he did not stay and try and talk to her about it. No, he ran and left his garment behind. Sometimes, Running away from your temptations can be very difficult for you. Yeah. But it is always the wise thing for you to do. You can tell the devil doesn't like when you free from your temptation because that makes his job just a little bit harder. Yeah. James chapter 4 and verse number 7 says, resist the devil and he'll flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then verse, nine, verse number 8 says, draw near to God. And he will draw nearer to you. Now, as Christians, we have power over the devil. I said we got power over him. And we can resist him by fleeing temptation. And by resisting him, we got to flee. Jesus did this very thing to the devil when he was out in the wilderness. The old devil came along and tried to get him on three different occasions to sin. And, and, and each time Jesus resisted him by quoting scriptures that showed it would be wrong for Jesus to partake in such temptation. Now, finally, Jesus drove him away, saying in verse number 10, away with you, Satan. For as it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, it's very dangerous to keep the devil around and start thinking that you just gonna overcome him. Come on now. I say you can't be around with the devil, in company with the devil, and feel like you're gonna rub off on him. Come on, come on, come on. 
I'm going to make him better. I'm trying to change him. I'm trying to change her. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get them to change their way. Let me tell you, you got a hard enough time trying to change yourself. Stop trying to change individuals and make them do something. God is the only individual that can change the heart of a man and of a woman. And until an individual wants to do this something for themselves, ain't that going to happen anyway. Temptation, temptation, temptation is a temptation is a sleepy, unwearying enemy watching and waiting to finally catch you off guard. Now we should be able to understand why Paul wanted Timothy to flee temptation. We can all flee temptation and we must realize that we must we must do it on our own because God will be there where you lack. God is gonna take up the slack. What you cannot do, you could, let me tell you, you do all that you can. Put your best effort in, God gonna meet you at the end of it. Second Peter chapter two and verse number nine, it says, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Good God Almighty, he said, he said that the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Tell somebody, God gonna get me out this thing. He knows how to get us out of temptation and he and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. But children of God, not only are you to flee temptation, you got to flee the love of money. The love of money was not just a problem for the first century. It has been a problem with mankind throughout all generations. Some have misunderstood what Paul teaches about money because some think that Paul is saying that money is evil and that we should flee from it. But y'all know as well as I know. The greenback make the horse track. But that ain't the case. What Timothy and we are to do is to flee the love of money. Money itself is useful for serving God. You know you can't have heat and air without money up in here. You, you, you know you can't even have this facility without money. None of the things that you enjoy, you can't have it without money. Money of itself is needful for the kingdom of God and to take care of your family. You need some money. There's not even nothing evil about money itself. But notice his Paul's instructions to the rich. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, he says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but rather to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. There are many good things that can be done with money. However, the love of money is an evil master that drives you into being greedy into being dishonest and all kinds of evil. What was the first recorded problem that faced the church shortly after the church was established? It was the love of money. In Acts chapter five, Ananias and Sapphira went out there and bought them a little bit of piece of land. And you know, they came and they bought back some money, but they say, you know what, you know what, man, this just too much to give it all, you know? You know, we can't give it all to him. You know, we, we just take a, you know, pinch off a little bit and we'll take it over there and we'll take our part and we'll put it over here. And they brought that to Peter and they claimed that they were given all that they had. Yes, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? 
And after it was sold, was it not under your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. Because of their love of money, which motivated them to lie, they paid with their life. Paul didn't want Timothy to get caught up in traps like this. He didn't want to have a love for something, here it is, that's just temporary. Notice what Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 5. When you set your eyes on that which is not, for riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives a parable about sowing seed for different types of soils. These soils represent different types of hearts that the word of God fall on. Notice what Jesus said about the thorny soil in Matthew chapter 13 verse 22. He said, now he receives seed among the thorns. Is he who hears the word and takes care of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches that choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. The love of money is temporary and the love of money can choke out God's word making you unfruitful. Surely we can see why Christians should flee from the love of money. So not only should you flee from temptation, not only should you flee from the, the, the love of money, but then you got to flee all kinds of evil. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's it. Amen. Somebody said, what evil? All of them. Oh, yeah. Notice only Paul gives specific things for Timothy and all Christians to flee. He also tells him to flee all kinds of evil. You know what? Just in case you think of something else that's inclusive of everything else. <laughs> this means we ought to flee from anything that is immoral, that is harmful according to God's word. You see, we are going to reap exactly what we sow. And Paul goes on to tell us in Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he said, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness in the indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. You see, there are serious consequences when we allow ourselves to get involved in evil things. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 22, it says, abstain from every form of evil. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 9. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, and cling to those things that are good. And then you got to flee greediness. Tell somebody, stop being greedy. <laughs> greediness is defined as, Webster says, excessively eager to acquire or possess something beyond what you need. Let me get a little bit closer. Excessively eager to acquire and possess something beyond what it is that you need. Being greedy is where the love of money comes from. Notice how Paul Describes some of the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. A greedy person is one who is selfish. And they only think about three people, me, my, and I. And how they can lay hands on stuff that you don't really need. The word of God teaches completely different messages 
than this because it tells us to put others before ourselves. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 and 4 said, Let nothing be done with selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of other people. Maybe you got to look out for your brother. You got to look out for your sister. A great example of greediness can be seen in young children. Let's say that you have three kids and you hold in front of them three different sizes of candy balls. Which candy ball do you think all three of them going to want? I want the big, he got the big one last time, I don't want. They gonna want the big one. They will want the biggest one, even if it's just that much bigger than the other one. Whoever doesn't get the biggest one is gonna cry and is gonna complain because they did y'all are hearing what I'm saying. We must be careful as children of God not to be greedy or the devil will trap you and keep you away from God. You got to remember what Jesus said about money. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and dust doth corrupt, nor thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor dust nor corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. As Christians, you don't need to be greedy. Tell them again, stop being greedy. And then we got to flee foolish lust. The word lust is associated with unlawful sexual desires. When a person tries to fill the desires in an improper way, it becomes sinful. Uh -huh. Foolish and destructive. The world does not exercise and restrain when it comes to lustful practices. You can easily see that by watching the TV. You can see that on Twitter. You can see it on Instagram. You can see it on Facebook. It's been on Snapchat everywhere. You can see that. It's getting harder and harder to find a program on television that doesn't pro promote some kind of unlawful sex in one way or another. Because of that destructive nature, Paul's advice to Timothy and all Christians, flee youthful lusts. Paul gave some good advice to the Romans on this topic in Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. He said, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not with strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Amen. Christians, should not allow the lust of the flesh to rule your life. Listen at me. Trevante did not say you're not going to struggle with it. But I said you ought not let that be the ruler of your life. Christians should not allow the lust of the flesh to rule their lives. You remember when the apostle John commanded the Christians not to love the world, neither the things that are what? In the world. And it tells them to avoid three things. First John chapter 2, verse number 16. He said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Notice two of the things that are avoided got to do with lust. There's no way that a Christian can follow after foolish lusts and still serve God. I'll say it again for the light bulb in the back. There's no way. There's no way you as a child of God can follow after foolish lusts and still be able to serve God. Paul also uses the term lasciviousness to describe lust. Those who do not flee foolish lusts will find that they will become a friend to the world but an enemy to God. 
James chapter 4 and verse number 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses. They mean all of them. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes themselves an enemy of God. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 19 basically says that those who live in this type of environment cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, when Paul was writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 22, he says, flee youthful lust. While there's really not an age limit to who can fall prey to lust, but it does seem to be more of a problem for the younger than the older. The middle age than the older. And the older say, man, you don't know yet. And some of the older. A person, when you feel, when you figure out you have that problem, we need to listen because we don't talk about this enough in the house of God. And, and, and we need to be instructed not on some things, but on all things. A person needs to nip it in the bud when you feel like you have issues or that it could grow into something that is really dangerous or would be bad for you. You need to nip that thing in the bud. You see, it's like a fire that starts out with a few flames that are controllable. But the longer you let it burn, the bigger it's going to grow. And the more out of control it's going to get. This is why it is imperative that you run away from these temptations. I think we can see what Paul wants Timothy to flee is something every Christian should flee from. The word tells us that we can be involved in these sins and still be a Christian. That's what the world will tell you. But the Bible tells us something different. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Verse, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Write this down. If you don't remember nothing else, I want you to remember this. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. You know it. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sowed, that shall he also reap. You going around being evil and doing evil, you going to get back evil. You going out lying and digging ditches, folks going to be lying and digging ditches for you. You going out causing trouble, trouble going to be caused for you. You go out and plant apple seeds. You ain't looking for no grapes. You go out and plant cotton. You ain't looking for oranges. Wherever you sow church. That's what you're going to reap. So start thinking. When things happen in your life. It ain't that God is punishing you. You just reap it. You know, you know, not just sinners reap what they sow. Christians reap what they sow as well. Because a lot, a lot of us, I say a lot of us got it messed up. Because we think that God just going to overlook our stuff because we are Christian, because we are child. If God did not spare his own son from dying on the cross, what makes you think he going to spare you from whipping your behind when you need it? The Bible says that those that he loved, he chased us. What you used to tell your child, I'm doing it because I love it. I'm doing it because I love you. I don't want you to end up on the wrong side of the track. So the next time you think about doing something crazy, you're going to remember I'm doing it because And don't pray me no little one because I'm going to go get another one and pray them up. What? Whatever you do, church.
church. It's coming back to you. Might not come back tomorrow. Might not come back next week. Look, some of y'all can sometimes it'll come back through your children. Oh, God got one more than one way to skin a cat, don't he? It don't, it don't always come back in the way that you think it'll come back. But God got a way of humbling you. God got a way of bringing you down. Because sometimes we get on such a pedestal and on such a cloud. We think we got it all. We doing it all. But let me tell you, child of God, the same way you went up. God know how to bring you back down. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The world calls it karma. That whatever you do, it eventually is going to come back to you. It's an energy that whatever you put out is what you're going to get. You walk around every time somebody tries to speak to you. Folks just trying to be kind. You, you know where I graduated from? Do you know where I am employed? Do you see what I am driving? Do you know who my father is? Don't none of that mean a hill of beans. My Bible says that all of our righteousness in the outside of God ain't nothing but filthy rags. It might impress you, but it ain't that impressive to God. It, 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 might, it might give you what you need, but it don't mean nothing to God. Whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap it. So try sowing good seeds. Start, start trying. If you tired of going out there and they coming out the ground, try plant some good seed. Because you're going to reap exactly what you sow. Amen. So I want you, church, to think about your life and ask yourself, am I fleeing or am I abiding? Am I fleeing? Am I trying to get away from it? Or am I making every excuse I can think of to stay with it? Am I doing what I can to make myself better? Or have I gotten comfortable where I'm at? Have, 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 have I allowed the sins of my flesh, the lust of my flesh, to consume me to a point to where I'm no longer seeking after God? Because I'm content with my lust and with my sin? Am I trying to flee from the lust of temptation? Or am I doing all I can to put myself back in environments that are going to cause me to do that very same thing that I prayed to God 500 times to change? Am I fleeing from the love of money? Or am I like Seely, out by the mailbox? What's up? <laughs> Waiting on my taxes to come just so I can cheat and get more than I'm supposed to get. Am I fleeing from the love of money? Or am I doing everything I can just to get over? Am I robbing Peter and paying Paul? Am I doing everything that I can to undercut? Or am I fleeing away from those things? Am I fleeing temptation? Am I fleeing the love of money? And then, am I fleeing all kinds of evil? What evil? All of them. Am I fleeing these things? Look, because it can cause a snap. Am, am, I, am I fleeing being greedy? You know when you fool. <laughs> you 
All of us, all of us ought to be filling out a card for that. Where the cards at? Stop passing out them cards. Somebody need to repent. Somebody need to come to Jesus today. You know when you fool. But just because you know it's in there. Go on in there. Are you fleeing being greedy? Or are you so busy looking at how she living? Looking at how he living? And because he got this, or oh, I got to go over here and get me some. Or oh, oh, because she got this, or oh, I got to come over here. Oh, that's called being greedy. Are you fleeing youthful lust? Are you fleeing foolish lust? And that in and of itself is a whole nother sermon. But are you, are you fleeing from it? Because, and I'm going to say it like this, and, and this is going to be the end of it. God see you. If I see you or not, don't mean a hill of beans. If anybody in here don't mean a hill. God is watching you. And you may think that you can get away. You may think it'll be all right. But God is watching. And if you die in your sin, where God is, you cannot go. If you find that these things are hindering you from serving God, you need to start running. You need to start fleeing. You need to get away from it. And if you don't want to get away from it, ask yourself this question. Is it worth your soul? Is it worth your soul? Not only is it worth your soul, but is it worth you being blessed? Because I'm aware that all spiritual blessings are found in Jesus Christ. And I cannot be a recipient of those blessings if I'm found outside of the will of God. So when I'm asking God and beckoning to God, Lord, I need, Lord, I need, Lord, I want, Lord, I want, and he ain't showed up yet, you need to start doing inventory of your life. What's in my life? What in my life right now was present that I know God would not be pleased with? Nobody in here is a fortune teller. I don't, I don't know nobody in here that's no prophet. Don't nobody know about you but you. And God. It's some things your own spouse don't even know about you. They still learning about you. Every day, Lord, Lord really? That's something. <laughs> just don't look over at him. You'll be all right. Just don't. Just don't look over there. Look straight ahead at the preacher. You, you were focusing on Trevante. Baby, I wouldn't even listen to what he was saying. <laughs> still, not only are you still learning about them, truth be told, you still learning about yourself. Still learning about your abilities, what you have the, the capacity to do, what you have the ability to do. You're still learning. Yeah. You're still trying. But church, let me tell you, you can never get to be all of who God wants you to be with baggage. That's why it was imperative that when you came to Jesus, that you brought him everything. Because you were starting to walk with God. And so many of us, the promised land looked good. The, the, what we'll say the next level all of that looks good but we want to take everything we got here over there, over there. Oh, recognizing that if you take everything from over here over there you change locations but you're still in the same environment in a, in a different place but you're still dealing with the same same old stuff so what is it that you need to run away from? Is it greediness? Don't be ashamed. Everybody been greedy before in their life. And if they say they ain't, there's no day of. 
They up their father, the devil. I say it like that. You greedy, you got anger problems. You need to run away from that. You got problems with your attitude. You don't know how to speak with people. Don't know how to work with people. You need to run from that. If you if you got a, a lying spirit. You need to, and I, I think all of us to get what them cars at. Let's get them cars back out. We need, we need the head ID card. We need to run away from it. Yes. Because we just don't recognize a lot of stuff that we do got domino effects. Yes. And the one little thing that you think is insignificant got some long-standing problems that it caused. Yes. Whatever it is in your life that is keeping you from being all of who God wants you to be, church, get away from it. And again, if you don't want to get away from it, ask yourself, is it worth my sin? Is it worth, is temporary pleasure worth eternal damnation? Because I think we forget hell is real. We don't talk about it enough. Hell is a real place for real people. You know, there's going to be plenty of Christians on judgment day. Standing before God. Just knowing, man, they just know they got to see. They're going to hear God say, depart from me. You worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Cast into the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. It's going to be a lot of folk going to have gate trouble. Because you're going to be taking your greediness with you. You're going to be taking your lust with you. You're going to be taking your anger with you. All that animosity to God. You're going to be taking that with you. And if you die with that stuff. Ain't no such thing as getting right on the other side. Well, I'm waiting on Jesus to come back. I'm going to get right when God come back. It's going to be too late. But like the children in Noah's time. Noah been preaching all this time. It's gonna rain, y'all. Get ready. It's gonna rain. It's gonna. You, you, you better get ready. It's gonna rain. I'm telling you, man. It's a rain coming like you ain't never seen before. It's gonna rain. They didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hearken unto what the man of God was saying until. It'll be the day Jesus come back. Everybody wanted to run. Oh, Lord, Jesus, forgive me. Oh, Lord, I, oh, I'm sorry for what I've done. He said there will be many in that day. Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not do that? Did I not do that? Jesus said, I never knew you. You know how sad it'll be to the king, to all the Bible studies you came to? Went to all the churches, collected all. Oh, you come to your house, you got every track that ever been printed out. You got it, got it all. They got, look, you got them in alphabetical order. You, I can teach you about A. I can teach you about B, C, D, E, F, D. I can teach you all about I got it laid out. Uh, <laughs> soon as you get in my car, I got Chris Turner on the radio. We boom, you know. All of that. I'm doing all of that. And to die. And hear God say, depart from me. Because a lot of us feel like, I think I do good enough that he'll overlook the wrong that I do. That's the attitude a lot of people have. That I, I'm, I, look, because here it is, we got our checklist. I, I, I got there about before 11 o'clock. I sung one or two songs, check. I took the community, check. Watch out, watch out, watch out. I, 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 I somewhat listened to your check. I give next Sunday, check. So we think, as long as I done did my five acts, I'm good. But live a raggedy life. This is not 
the way you prove your Christian. We know you got baptized. We know. We know you're a member of the church. We know that because you're here. What do they see on the outside? If I come on your job and do a survey, what would I learn? Let me say, if I come look at your refrigerator, what I'm going to think about you? <laughs> well. <laughs> Get away from it. Whatever, whoever it is. Because sometimes it ain't a what, it's a who. Whatever it is. You remember when Jesus told me, he said, you shall speak to this mountain. And you shall say to the mountain, remove and cast into the sea. And it shall be done and nothing shall be impossible to you. You got to understand, he wasn't talking about a physical mountain. He wasn't talking about a physical structure. But whatever this issue is, whatever this problem that I'm facing, whatever this issue is that I have, I can speak to this thing. And it shall be done. What is your mountain? What is your bridge that you got to cross? You ought to be like Caleb. Give me my mountain. I'm, I am able. I can take it. I can overcome. I can succeed. Over this thing. Give me my mountain. I'm not going to have cirrhosis of the liver. I can put the bottle down. Hell, long cancer. I can leave Newport and the one hundreds in the camel alone. I'm not going to die from a stroke. I know I got high blood pressure. I'm going to stop eating all that pork and stuff. I know I don't. Whatever it is. Whatever this mountain is that you're facing. Because it's this mountain today. It'll be that mountain tomorrow. And if I don't deal with what I got to deal with today, I'm going to have more trouble I got to deal with on tomorrow. <laughs> Nip it in the bud. Why you, when you recognize that it's an issue, deal with it. And sometimes just coming to church won't help it. Sometimes you got to go talk to somebody. You might have to go sit on somebody's couch and talk to somebody. Because some people are dealing with some deep-rooted issues. Some people are dealing with some stuff that if you open up the box, it's going to take you back to childhood. Some people, some people are dealing with some stuff that if you open up the box, it's going to take them to a place that they do not want to go. Which is why they avoid conversation. Which is why they avoid recognizing the issue because it's going to open up some talk. But whatever it is, you can overcome. You don't have to be what they say. You don't have to succumb to what they did to you. You can get over it, church. You can get over it. Get away from it. You cannot progress staying around it. Eating with it. Going shopping with it. Riding around town with it. It's not going to work like that. You got to get away from it. Leave it alone. Leave them alone. Man, you know, man, they already had you down there counting two or three times. They got you in this area. Leave them alone. Sometimes you got to leave family alone. Sometimes friends that you was with in the sandbox, you got to leave them alone. Because if you are keeping me from where God wants me to be, I got to flee. I got to flee. 
I got to flee. And you know, there's some of us in closing got to flee from ourselves. Some of us got to get away from ourselves because we are our own worst enemy. A lot of stuff that we deal with is what we call self-inflicted. We know that it's a dead end at the end of the road. We've been told a million times that was a dead end. We saw the signs, dead end ahead, and went anyway. And then want to get mad with God. Lord, why you didn't stop me from going off? Lord, why you didn't stop me from doing it? God gave you good sense. You just ain't use it. Child of God, you can overcome. You can get over the temptations of this life. Jesus was able to overcome the devil himself. He overcame him and him to his temptation. Because he recognized that anything that the devil promised him was empty. It was empty and it was void of promise. And then anything that he could have gave him was just going to be temporary. Church, this world is not our home. We just sojourners, pilgrims, pass us by through barren land. And you know, one of these days, I don't know where you're going, but you got to get away from here. You got to get away from here. Are you prepared for what's next? Are you making preparation? Are you getting yourself ready for what is next? The Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. Yep. And, then. and then after death comes the judgment. We're going to all have to stand before the judgment bar of Christ. Give an account of the things that we have done in this body. Those things good. And those things bad, it's coming up again. That's why you ought, to, you ought to have a repentant heart. Whenever you do wrong, whenever you find yourself in opposition of God, you ought to be trying to get back on the right side with God. Because it don't take but one sin to separate you from your father. So whatever it is, church, flee from it. Run away. Leave it where it is. Run from it. And let me tell you, that doesn't mean that while you're on the run, you're not going to have the temptation. To you, you're not going to have the... At least when I was back there, I had the flesh pots of Pharaoh. There you go. There you go. And now I'm out here, you know. I got to wait on a bird to bring me some manna. I got to wait on a rock to open up to give me some water. You know, at least I could go back. You left that behind for a reason. You know, on your car, in the mirror, it says objects in the mirror are just a little bit closer than they appear. Stop looking back because just as quick as you got ahead, you'll be right back where you just left from. You'll be right back where you just left from. You can flee from it. You can get away from it. If you have the desire to. Christ says, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. In other words, you ain't got to deal with it by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to handle it by yourself. I'm willing, I'm ready, and I am able to aid you with what it is that you're going through. But you got to, first of all, give me the opportunity to work in your life. God is not going to come pry your arms open to get anything. Away. He's not going to kick your door down asking you to give it up. You got to come to him. He said, he said come unto me. All you that are weary and heavy laden. And I get, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and gentle in heart. And you shall find rest for your soul. You shall find rest. Children of God, maybe you're here today. Or maybe there's someone that is watching us. And you are not a Christian. Um, you don't yet know the Lord. Um, as you're saved, you've not been baptized into the body of Christ, which is the church of Christ. Um, God has made it very simple. Um, it is we as individuals that complicate it. Um, Jesus said, um, come unto me again, all you that are weary heavily, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He is inviting us. He said, anyone will come and open the door. He said, I'll come in and sup with you. I'll come in and make my abode with you. 
Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. Are you going to let him in? He's standing at the door. He's knocking. He's waiting. Are you going to allow him to come in and make the difference that you're looking for? Come by hearing his word. Believe in the same. That he lived, that he died. On the third day he rose again with all power in his hand. And that one day he's coming back to receive his own. You got to hear the word, believe the same, repent of your sins. Repentance is a change in my mind that produces a change in my action. After repentance, I confess with my mouth the sweetest name known to mortal tongue. And that is that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And after confession, you're willing to be baptized for the remission of your sin. Have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And the Lord himself will add you to his body. And this is for us. You know, Sunday after Sunday, there are many of us that come and we leave out the same way that we came. We don't want to ask for prayer. We don't want to ask for forgiveness because we care too much about how folks going to look. We care too much about what, I wonder what she's dealing with. I wonder what they're going through. It ain't none of their business. If you know you need prayer, you need to ask for prayer. If you know that you got some things in your life that you're struggling with, you know you got some things that you are battling with, you need to ask for prayer. For this kind, Lord, not out, but by fasting and by prayer. Come by hearing this word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, being baptized, living faithful unto death. And as Paul said, you receive a crown of life that will never fade away. Maybe you're here and you're subject to the invitation. We beg and we plead. Don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. Today, while you have this opportunity, why not come to Jesus now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation. He's sweet I know. Yes, he's sweet I know. And you know that dark cloud may